Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Kiana Holloman and Dora Trillo. How y'all doing, ladies? Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. It seems like it's been forever since we did the last episode, right? Yeah, good to see you guys, for sure. Yeah, great. Great Welcome to see next. you as well. So, absolutely. So I'm super excited about our next guest, that, and he is definitely... Uh, on Godfather status when it comes to the entertainment business. So without further ado, Kiana, please introduce our next guest. So today's guest is an acclaimed actor with a 50 year career in TV and movies, including Simon and Simon and Major Dad and NCIS Los Angeles. In 2017, he received a primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Guest Actor in a Drama Series for his work as obstetrician Dr. K on This Is Us. He has played retired Admiral Hollis Kilbride on NCIS Los Angeles since 2014 and became a series regular this season. He's also a staunch advocate for veterans. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Gerald McRaney. Hey. Hey. Good morning, guys. Hey, Mac, and thank you so much for joining us today. You betcha. It's my pleasure. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from today? Well, I'm in my rental house in Encino. I'm still working on NCIS Los Angeles. Um, so my wife and I sold our place in Studio City. We're going to be eventually moving to Florida, but I have to have digs while I'm here working. So we rented a, a relatively small house in Encino uh, so I can go to work every day. Oh yeah, well, uh, I'm sure Florida, Florida's not a bad place to live <laughs> at all. So, uh... no, I'm looking forward to being in Florida. I've always liked it. Delta, of course, grew up there um, in the Orlando area, so we're back in Central Florida again. Awesome. Well, that's super exciting. Um, we'd like to start off our conversation today by talking about your role as Admiral Kilbride on NCIS Los Angeles which airs Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern on CBS. So what's the story behind your evolution from an occasional guest star to a more frequent guest star to a series regular? Oh, I guess they finally got comfortable with me. I really don't know. Um, I, I think they needed or wanted uh, an older presence on a regular basis on the show. And Linda was having some health issues she still comes on and works occasionally, and I just adore the lady, but I, I think they wanted some uh, older presence on the show, some somebody uh, who could bring some gravitas to it, or uh, <laughs> at least age. So um, <laughs> since I had already been doing Admiral Kilbride for a little while, I guess they decided to be they better stick with something they knew. Right. <laughs> Sounds well, they good. want so wisdom. Now, we won't say we won't say old. We'll, we'll say wisdom or or something something, yeah, something better than old. That. That, that's fine. I'll okay. go with that. <laughs> no, it's it's nice to see when they expand on on characters that you know you kind of get to meet at first. Though. But you know you haven't had many roles in your career, so um, it's, you know we, we we're used to seeing you on on our TV. But you seem be busier than ever during the past few years. With that role on S NCIS Los Angeles and Filthy Rich, you know, This Is Us, Shooter, Man, House of Cards, and and more, um, 24 Legacy. What motivates you to stay so busy? Ultimately, because I don't know what else I would do. There's so much hunting and fishing a guy can do before he gets bored. Um, <laughs> I just I, the the term retirement just doesn't occur to me. Uh, because it would sort of be like being a retired golfer. What would you do for leisure? You got to go play yeah. golf. Um, and when I started out doing this, I was doing it for free. I suppose I would do it that way again, but why not make some money while you're doing it? And I just, I can't imagine not going to work. I, it just, it, it, 
it's something I don't think I could live with. And I've known too many people who retired and within a year or two, <laughs> they're dead. So yeah. I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah. Well, listen, that's um, when, when you love something so much, you know, it, it isn't even at work at that point. It's, it's something that you enjoy doing. So it's not even it's more leisure than, than work. Well, I tell people all the time, I haven't done a day's work in 50 years. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So um, you, so I remember you from uh, Major Dad. I was, I was small. I was probably about 10 years old when that show was running. Uh, so I, I didn't get a lot of perspective from it. I just you know, saw you with your, 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 your drill instructor hat or, or your, your nice Marine uniform, uh, which Fast forward the eight years after that. will make anybody look good. It, exactly. So so fast forward eight years from 10, you know, I joined the Marine Corps uh, just and, and, and the reason why is probably not anything that's really a, a good story. But uh, <laughs> I am I've been in the Marine Corps and uh, I've been in the military for the past 24 years. I'm, I'm currently an airman, of course. And, uh, you know, looking back on those shows uh, definitely gave me a. Uh, you know, watching it as an adult, I was able to kind of put myself in, in, in see, remember my time in the Marine Corps and juggling being a parent and also being a service member as well. So uh, thank you for creating that that long ago so I can go back and kind of get some nostalgia from it. Uh, it's my pleasure. One of the things we wanted to do with that show was not so much to uh, show life uh, in the Marine Corps just from the Marines perspective, but um, the life of a military family. I, I told you before we went on the air that my uh, brother-in-law was an Air Force officer and stationed all over the world. And um, the, the strain that is sometimes put on uh, wives, husbands, and children of uh, the service member themselves uh, is stuff that a lot of people don't really understand how difficult that lifestyle can be. And I, I wanted to do something that would sort of illustrate that. And I hope we did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you said, uh, the military family, uh, they, they sacrifice just as much as the military members. So a big shout out to every, all the military families out there watching, uh, watching this episode. Yeah. So, so you said you learned a lot about the Marines playing uh, a Marine and major dad. So, uh, playing Admiral Kilbride, did it teach you something about the Navy that you didn't know? Um, or? Not so much <clears throat> stuff that I didn't know about the Navy because NCIS is sort of its own thing. It, it's not directly associated with the Navy so much, at least not on this show. Uh, so you don't have a lot of uh, military protocols and things like that to deal with the way we did on Major Dad. Um, but I've got several friends. One of my best friends in the world was uh, a naval aviator. He flew helicopters in Vietnam. Um, and I've I, several other friends who were Navy and still are, uh, you know, for that matter. I mean, once you're a sailor, you're always a sailor, just as once a Marine, always a Marine. Um, so I knew a bit about the Navy before I accepted the role. Um, but you learn little bits and pieces. It's hard to sort of isolate one or two individual things that you learn, but you just sort of assimilate things as you go along with these shows. Um, the one thing I think I have going for myself in my approach to these roles is to have respect uh, for the branch, respect for the military altogether. Um, and then some empathy for what it must be like to do that job 24-7. Uh, I, I don't know that I could do it, but I certainly admire people who can. Yeah. No, definitely. We definitely support um, the warfighters and their families for sure, for all that they do. And we are really big on serving them the same way that they serve us. So your support for the troops goes back even farther as your acting career. And I know you mentioned you have friends who served um, and that you know people who probably still serve to this day. So what else inspired your lifelong support for the U.S. military? Well, this began, um, well, in childhood to begin with, I remember um, 
in the 50s when my father would see uh, anybody in uniform hitching a ride, we would generally take them to where they were going, not just as far as we were going. Um, so I learned a lot of it from my dad. Um, and all the men around me in my life when I was a kid, football coaches, uh, history teachers, um, scoutmasters, people like that, were World War II and Korea veterans. And so I just sort of by osmosis, I guess, as much as anything else, picked up how one should be respectful of men and women who would willingly sacrifice anything up to and including their lives to keep a kid like me safe. And um, that's not something you let go of. Uh, that's something that sticks with you for the rest of your life once you've come to that realization that that's what those people do. My pool man just right. showed up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really neat that it started, you know, it starts at home. You learned it. You know, from your parents. And my dog just realized that the pool man oh. just showed up. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, yeah, I was just saying it. It's really cool that you 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 started off, um, or that you learned that, or got that from from home. <laughs> oh, on, there you go. <laughs> Zelda, come. Now, sit, sit. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, good. Okay, oh, go man, ahead, so guys. Well, we were just going <laughs> to take it back to an old, uh, another oldies, Simon and Simon. Um, and we heard that when that began, you asked the producers to make Rick Simon a Vietnam veteran. And then later you actually co-wrote an episode um, centering on PTSD. So what was the, the story behind that or those decisions? Well, back in the 70s, you guys are not old enough to remember this, but back in the 70s, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do something about her. She's going to bark at these guys unless I put her in another room. Can you stand by for one minute? We, we definitely can. can. Zelda is making a cameo appearance. She, yes, we love yeah. that. She walks up into the left here. <laughs> yeah, no, no, listen, the more the merrier. We, we, mm -hmm. I think we had John Stewart on, and he, he had a, like a parakeet. He had dogs. He had cats. I thought it was like Ace Ventura, the pet detective, uh, that we because he had <laughs> all the problems things. of working at home. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good to go. Well, anyway, as I was saying, back in the 70s, there was this sort of recurrent thing that everybody on television did at one point or another. Everybody had to have their episode about the crazed Vietnam veteran. And it was just a regular thing that you know, anybody who had served in Vietnam was about a half a bubble off plum and wanted to kill people. And that just sort of was a burr under my saddle. And so when it came my turn to do something in television, I wanted to make my little statement about that and have people understand that the folks in the military and especially the guys who had seen combat and awful combat were just the guy who lived down the street from you. They were your neighbor or your uncle or your father or, you know, any number of guys who were just guys like you who were ordinary people who had been called on to do an extraordinary thing and they did it. And I just wanted to do that to make, to normalize um, military people and especially combat veterans. And then when I wrote the episode on PTSD, it was because I had been invited to speak to a group down in San Antonio, Texas. It was a convention of physicians assistants, most of whom had been corpsmen and medics in Vietnam. And a lot of them worked with psychiatrists trying to transition guys out of that severe depression uh, that PTSD is and get them back into some sense of uh, normality. And I talked to these guys about what real PTSD was and then went back uh, to LA 
and talked to my producers and said, I want to have a crack at, at writing something about this so that maybe people will understand it a little better. And they have yeah, so. Ahead of its time, because we do see that a, a lot now, but back then I don't think it was, um, you know, uh, put out on the forefront. So that's definitely ahead of No, uh, it wasn't. Nobody was dealing with it. No. Yeah, it's a... Um... It's it's a very prevalent conversation now, and we appreciate you for e even taking that step. You know, back back in the in the seventies, man. That's um, you know, you know, just kind of hearing that because I think when I first joined the military, I we weren't really talking about it that much, uh, as much as we are right now. But um, you know, like you said, that's super ahead of its time. Uh, you know, having an episode, and, and you're right, we did we didn't treat the Vietnam veterans the way we should have uh, as a country. No. Uh, for them coming back and uh here at the exchange we really make it a deliberate effort to make sure that if we see a vietnam vet we have you know vietnam pins and and, and certificates and we try to make sure and we have events every year at all of our stores um on, on the installation for our vietnam uh veterans and we try to make sure that we if welcome them home back like in the the first persian gulf war there were a lot of celebrations of the guys coming home we were victorious uh and there was a big celebration uh, about the first Persian Gulf War. And uh, being stationed at Keesler, um, I think you might be familiar with the way people are over in Louisiana, but in the Superdome, they were gonna have a big parade to celebrate the guys coming home uh, from the Middle East. And all of the soldiers and airmen and Marines and sailors got together and collectively said, we will do your parade in the Superdome with one proviso, that Vietnam veterans lead the parade. And um, that meant something. Yeah. yeah, no, that was, that, that's amazing. Like I said, um, yeah, I, I, I love, we got a chance to recognize some Vietnam veterans uh, on the field at the uh, Army Air Force game. And just, you know, just talking to them and, uh, man, it's, it's, just, it's just an amazing, uh, they got so many great stories, they're great people. And to just to think that, you know, them coming back from a, a contingency, they, they get treated at, or not, not the best, uh, you know, it's just, it sucks. It sucks to, it sucks to hear that, even though I didn't live. Yeah, it time. does. It does. And it, you know, it was a shameful chapter in our history that people treated our servicemen that way. Uh, whether you were for or against the war, um, service people don't have a choice in that. Uh, right. Service people follow their orders. That's the way it works. And our military is under civilian authority. We don't have a military dictatorship in this country. We don't have a military government in this country. It's civilians who get us into these things, and it's military people who then have to fight them. And there's a, a big difference. And you can protest wars all you want to, but the guys who do it are just doing their job and you know thank god we have them absolutely so you, you visited the you, you visited the troops overseas multiple times and so is there a standout memory from one of those visits that you can uh, share with us oh too many too many um uh, when i was in somalia for instance um there was a then colonel bedard now general bedard and the Marine Corps, I think he's retired by now. But um, he and I just got along great. And he got me trained up on uh, um, doing sort of a ride along and being a able to load the main gun. And I was out on patrol at night with the Marines through Mogadishu and uh, Abrams tanks. Um, I, I, I think I was the only entertainer who was allowed to stay in country at night because I I knew the commanding general, and I didn't want to waste time flying back and forth to some luxury hotel in Kenya. So I talked him into letting me just stay in country with Marines. And that was my favorite part of that trip was just at night when they're cleaning their weapons and having their chow and maybe having a cup of coffee or something, just sit around and chew the fat with those guys. Because, you know, when I do a USO tour, I don't dance, I don't sing, I don't tell jokes. All I can do is hang out with guys. And 
It's supposed to be a morale booster, and it works. I mean, when I left there, my morale was soaring. I don't know how theirs was, but it made me feel awfully good. Man, so I, I'm going to tell you how small the world is. So uh, Major General Bedard was my commanding general uh, when I was a, a Lance Corporal uh, corporal sergeant. Well, no, cor Lance Corporal and Corporal at Camp Lejeune, uh, North Carolina. Uh, I didn't know him personally. Uh, I, I went to his his building and his office before, uh, but that, that's funny you said his name because um, as soon as you said it, it just popped in my brain. I'm like, man, that was my commanding general uh, at Camp Lejeune when I was when I was in he back is in '98. Great guy, I'll tell you. I think his call sign was Bulldog or something like that. Um, yeah. Or, or yeah. So, man, man, the world is so small. We're all connected in some form or fashion. Yeah. No kid. Well, and you know what? That is the statement about this country. We are all connected one way or the other. And um, that's one of the few bright things I think that uh, Ross Perot ever said is we better realize we're all in the same boat and everybody better grab an oar. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very true statement. So, so we know you're a, a huge supporter of the, our veterans, obviously. Um, so, talk to us about the works you've done to kind of honor those who've served. I, I think you had some wounded warrior project stuff that you. Oh, I've done things well. for wounded warrior projects. I've done things for paralyzed veterans association, for Vietnam veterans associations. But what I do is is stuff that I do in my spare time, and it's just. It is no big deal what I do. What they did is the big deal. What they continue to do is a big deal. Um, every once in a while, I'll catch myself whining and moaning about something that's gone wrong in my life. And I think about guys that I've visited missing arms and legs and with disfigured faces and things like that. And then I feel awfully puny about myself uh, it, it, it brings you up, puts things in uh, proper perspective. Uh, you know, the, 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 the little things that go wrong in my life are nothing, absolutely nothing. What these men and women did and continue to do is the stuff that people ought to be talking about. And quite frankly, those people should be celebrities. What I am as an actor, that's it. But we should be celebrating those lives. Uh, not somebody who does it for make believe. Yes, the men and women who serve us are definitely our heroes and they're America's heroes. And some of those heroes are watching us live right now. So what would you like to say to them today? Uh, first and foremost, thank you. Um, and I have always said that, that, that this business of thanking people for serving their country is a little bit, um, too obtuse. I thank them for serving me personally, for keeping me and my family safe and free. And I've traveled a lot of the world, and I think there are too many people in this country who don't have an appreciation, fully at least, of what that word free means. They, because they've never seen anything else, they have nothing to compare it to. But Freedom is, is a precious commodity, and it has to be guarded 24-7, and it's guarded by young men and women who choose to do it. Um, there may be other peripheral reasons that people join the military. Maybe they want to get a college education. Maybe they want to learn a job skill, and of course, all that is available. But ultimately, they know when they raise their hand that they could be putting their lives on the line and they do it anyway, and God bless them. I, I just have such admiration for that. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you. And actually, we're going to turn to our Facebook Live uh, just because that's what we're on, and we've got some feedback for you, if you don't mind me sharing real quick. We've got uh, Steve Darnell. He says, the lead on Major Dad, USMC. Um, Susan Jackson, she's saying, you're the man, Gerald McGraney. <laughs> Um, and of course, we've got some um, hello from Clay City, Kentucky, and Amfest Post 67. 
So you've got some major fans following us and watching this right now. Um, it looks like Steve came back and talked about your um, custom fit uniforms that you you had made. Um, just that's how USMC uniforms are, he says. Um, Chris Ward, he says, um, you know, you nailed a TV godfather, uh, talking about Chief um, nailing that. And um, so anyway, we've, you're getting a lot of love from back before Major Dad, say, Simon and Simon. They loved uh, Gerald's um, houseboat. You remember that? So they made yes, a point. Yes, indeed. <laughs> So yes, you're getting a lot of love, and, and and so we appreciate you being on here because, um, you know, Paula she says really loving the role on NCIS. So um, ah, good. Here's I've got there. a quick story for you about that uh, uniform. Back when we were first starting to do Major Dad, we went down to Camp Pendleton to the uniform shop so that the uniforms would be accurate, and not just something off a wardrobe truck. And I was having my uniform tailored by the lady who happened to be a Japanese-American lady uh, there at the uniform shop at Camp Pendleton. And she was down uh, pinning the, the cuffs on the trousers. And she looked up at me and said, you know, we do this backwards. I said, I beg your pardon. She said, we're doing this backwards. I said, I, I, what do you mean backwards? She said, you know, usually in the Marine Corps, we tailor the man to fit the uniform. <laughs> that's that's a very true statement because uh it spent, is indeed i spent three months i spent three months in uh in san diego uh camp pendleton uh doing basic training and uh they definitely they definitely uh customize you to their uniform because they, they get the pounds <laughs> off or or they, they put the pounds on if they if it need be so um if, if, yeah if anybody wants to go the individual Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Mac, I know you have a ton of things going on because you you like to stay busy. So, is there anything else ahead that you like to talk about? Any projects you can tell us about? No, there's nothing right now. A friend of mine and I are working on developing a script that we want to shoot in New Orleans, but uh, that's nowhere near being ready to talk about. Um, but. I'm just hoping, and I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with the idea that we'll continue to do NCIS Los Angeles for a while longer, because I'm having such fun on that show. That, that crew and that cast is the easiest to work with. And I told um, LL Cool J the other day that I have had more fun doing this show than any show since Simon and Simon. And that's saying something because that was eight years of stealing money. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love your character on NCIS Los Angeles. And for those of you who haven't tuned in but would like to, as a reminder, NCIS Los Angeles airs at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central Sundays on CBS. So, Mac, where can we go to find out more about you, your work, and your causes? Well, um, I suppose a local county jail would be a good place to check. <laughs> um, you know, post offices still put those pictures up and stuff. Uh, uh, now, the other, you know, I'm around. There are people still writing lies about me. So, you know, any number of places where you could check. <laughs> okay. No, we'll no, no social. <laughs> So, so no social social media for Mac, huh? No, no. I was on Facebook for a while, but I got bored with it. Oh. Actually, so you, you're actually out here living your life, huh? Instead of having it on 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 the internet. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> awesome, but Mac, man, it's been a, a honor and a pleasure having you with us today. Um, uh, I I just want to thank you for uh, the years of entertainment that you provided the world and our service members and the love and admiration you have for the folks that have worn the uniform and are currently wearing the uniform uh, because, you know, we, like you said, we're all connected and we're all, um, you know, the stuff that you do gives us a place of like kind of peace or, or solemn where we can kind of get away from all the, the craziness that we deal with on a regular basis and, and smile or cry or whatever it is, um, you know, whatever, Whatever the form is that, that that you're you're providing that entertainment, we can enjoy that, and we appreciate you for what you do. Well, the tours that I do with the USO, 
I called what I do is called a grip and grin tour because I don't, as I said, entertain. But I think that's the most important thing I contribute to the military on those tours is a handshake. And that handshake for me is symbolic because I think it represents millions of people in the United States who wish they could be where I was shaking the hand of a soldier or a Marine or an airman or a sailor who's off in some dangerous remote place doing a job that protects them and their families. And I think that handshake, I think those guys understand what that handshake means and I think they appreciate it. And I, uh, it, there's a strange part of me that thinks that it's not even my hand. It's America's hand that I'm reaching out. I just happen to have the privilege to do that. And on behalf of all the men and women in uniform, we, we do appreciate you. And so I, I, I want to, I want to say that not as know, much as I appreciate you, pal, believe me. Absolutely. So yeah, if you don't mind uh, hanging on uh, after the live, uh, I just, we can say our formal goodbyes, but, uh I just want to thank you again, and, and I appreciate you for, for hanging out with us. Hey, where would I go? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and so for all, all of our Chief Chat viewers out there, this episode will be available on YouTube and Spotify. You can also rewatch with your friends or catch up with past episodes. Uh, also, be sure to join us on February 1st, when I guess will be Jesse Awuji, and then join us on February 8th as we welcome Mitch Alba. So uh, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we're going to close it out and then chief chat out, you guys.